Ah, okay. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> All right. So we're about to go live. And All right. So I want to welcome everybody. It is Monday, July 12th the day that we've been waiting for for a very long time. <laughs> um, we are chatting with Ilona Bannister from the author of When I Ran Away. Um, a lot of people, I'm gonna have the book right here. Um, <laughs> we are so excited and honored to have you here with us today. Um, a lot of our friends and followers have started reading the book and we're gonna talk about it more in depth next week. Um, but I would love to just kind of have a little introduction of yourself and then we'll kind of get into it. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. It's, I was just saying before how nice it is to be able to connect with readers because it's been such a strange time for that. Um, so this is great. I love being able to talk to people about Gigi and especially being able to talk to moms about her. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about the book. Uh, Gigi is a, a New Yorker who's living in London with her British husband and her two children. And one morning, everything caves in on her. Uh, she's dealing with postnatal depression. Uh, she's upset about her marriage. Um, she has ongoing grief over the death of her brother on 9-11. And she just has a moment. She hits her breaking point. And she leaves her family. They're all on the doorstep. She's just in a bathrobe and flip-flops. And she goes wandering the streets. <laughs> of South London. Um, and this is the story of how she makes her way back. Uh, it's about going to the edge of depression and grief and trying to work your way back. And it was really important to me that for mothers, it's not a book about being your pre-baby self and getting into your pre-baby body and going back to your pre-baby job and pretending like you had a baby, but nothing happened to you. Um, it's a book about the person you become when you've had a child. And particularly if you've dealt with any kind of trauma, if you had a traumatic birth or any kinds of concerns about your child, how you heal and recover from that and acknowledging that it changes you. Um, I think that was one thing that when my kids were babies that I really struggled with, nobody acknowledges the change. Everyone wants you to go back to who you were before, but of course we know that's not possible. Right. Um, and it shouldn't be, that shouldn't be the expectation. Um, so yeah, so that is, that's what I hope Gigi is getting across. Yeah, definitely. Well, even just from the start of the book, um, and I won't, I won't give away any spoilers or anything, <laughs> um, but there are so many layers that, you know, once Gigi leaves and she finds her space to kind of, you know, grieve, <laughs> um, there's just so many layers that she goes through. Kate and I were talking about this the other day about how as when you become a new mom, um, you uh, trauma that you've had is also reintroduced into your life um, in a completely different way. And or maybe you haven't healed from it in a way that you needed to and that sort of thing. So just to see her, it's not she just has a baby and, you know, everything, you know, just kind of compounds on that. It it truly is this human experience of becoming a mother and dealing with everything around you. Yeah, um, and and it's also you know multi layered. Like I'm glad you said that because people assume that when you've had the baby, then it's all just about the baby. Right. Everyone forgets about the mother and what she may have been through before, and yeah. what did having a baby bring up for her, and what does holding a baby now mean to her and how how does what does that say about her relationship with her parents what are other things she's dealing with in her life that get triggered by this so in Gigi's um, situation it's grief over the loss of her brother that yeah. is really triggered by having the baby so you know women are multi-dimensional this thing happens where you become a mom and then suddenly it's like you're it's like a wall it's like a flat wall that's like you're just mom wall and that's all that anybody ever wants to know about you yeah um, but I think you're very right like there, there are a lot of layers to what the feelings you have um, when you have a baby and and what comes up right and so what part um, so when you were writing this book what was some research that you did because um, I, I believe you had an experience postpartum yourself, um, and maybe I, I could be wrong, but what was some research in 
Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I wrote the book because uh, both of my children were born traumatically. Um, they were both emergency C-sections under really difficult circumstances. Uh, they were only two years apart. Um, and I, after my second son was born, where we had a, a much more difficult time, um, I, I, I felt kind of a, a switch flip inside of me and I really needed to take some time out um, to recover. I wasn't quite sure why, as often happens with women who experience postnatal depression, there's so much going on. You're not quite sure what you're feeling, why you're feeling it. Is there a name for it? Is it just normal? Is it just your exhaustion? Um, so I saw after the birth of my second son, I sought help uh, because I could, could sense that things were really off for me. Um, I ended up taking time off work. So I stepped away from my job. I was a lawyer uh, and I stepped away, take time out. Um, and three years later, when I felt ready to go back, uh, I found that nobody wanted to hire me. Um, I was always very upfront about my child care needs and needing to be flexible. And I thought because I was a qualified person, um, someone would want me. Uh, it was only a three year absence, but I found it really, really difficult to get back to work. Uh, and I was at a really low point. Um, and that's when I started writing. I got into a writing class and this is what came out. Gigi is who came out. Um, she was, she, I would say she, she's been a character. I never intended to write anything at all. She was like my own internal monologue. Mm -hmm. um, so in those years when I was a stay at home mother, just pushing the around in the constant you know, cycle you do from the supermarket to the cleaners to the post office, the next to the house, and the next to the thing, and then pick them up from preschool, and then play it like just that constant circle that you do mm -hmm. lot, most of the time by yourself. Um, she was my sort of internal monologue. She was my friend, um, also because she was, you know, a New Yorker in London with me, and we were just observing how funny it is to live here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so when I started writing, she's the first. She's she's what came through. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot of it is based on, I, I wouldn't say that it's, um, it doesn't fully parallel my experience, but the, uh, the feelings are definitely feelings I had. Um, uh, I, obviously I had to fictionalize a lot of stuff so that my family would still speak to me, but um, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Some names are different. That's okay. <laughs> um, but a lot of it came from my own experience, but also, uh, women around me and what my friends were going through and how we all reacted differently in different ways um, watching some friends absolutely flourish and become you know the, the person they were meant to be when they became mothers and watching other friends have a struggle and have a really hard time um, mm -hmm. and and watching also all the women around me you know there are so many women that you you, you might just be friends with in passing at the school gates or drop off some pickups and you of nod at each other because you just know what she's going through right uh so a lot of those observations too but um it's definitely uh i would say the feelings are all genuine feelings i i went through and i gg became my vehicle for expressing that that's awesome um i yeah that's awesome and as i was saying earlier just even reading through the book like i have so many scribbles and like truth you know <laughs> written written through it and hearts and everything um even towards the end like there was i i re i think i read this book over probably like a three-day span of time um while in new york which was the best part of it all <laughs> um <It's> great but, <laughs> yeah <laughs> um but I, when I got to the end, I couldn't even read it because I was like, I was just so emotionally spent through the whole situation. And so it just took me just until recently till I could read the end and just, you know, again, not giving away anything, but to get through it. And so, um, I just, it's just such a beautifully written book and it's over, you know, the span of a, of a time of like, you know, a very short span of time. It's just over one day. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, there's just everything comes out. So, um, yeah, I, I thought that was really awesome. And then even at the end, you were talking about, you know, being inspired by the women that, you know, you just passed her on the street and 
you wrote a you know a little thank you to them as well so it's just it's just a wonderful book i can't speak highly enough <laughs> about it <laughs> um, thank you that's really kind um i'm really glad that it resonates like because it's um very scary to uh write about this kind of deep personal stuff um it's also very scary when you are a mother to reveal to people that it's difficult and that you've struggled and that there's anger involved in being a mother. I think we're really afraid of um, ever seeing mother have rage or ever picturing them as angry or upset. Um, we don't want our mothers to ever express that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of women hide. Um, there's several characters in the book who do that. They hide what they're really going through, Gigi included, mm -hmm. uh, because they're just so afraid of the judgment and they're just so afraid um, they're the only ones who feel this way because we don't talk about it openly. They think they're the only ones who are feeling this way. Um, and there is a lot of shame yeah. in it. There's a lot of shame in not being that perfect mother that you thought you were going to be and that other people look at you and assume that you are. Right. Um, so I think it's really important to kind of break open that shame shell and just say no it's it's a there's people yell at their kids people <laughs> you know when you're exhausted it's really hard to take care of a baby it's not delicious and lovely all the time it's mm -hmm. really hard work and nobody helps you and it's and it's, and it's it's exhausting um so i think it's important to express that but it was certainly for me i was scared about what their response would be but if it, if it resonates, it doesn't resonate with everyone. I've definitely had a few reviews where people thought that was, <laughs> that, that's not how I raise my children, but um, I'm glad that it has hit that chord with people. Yeah, definitely. Kate, is there anything you wanted to ask? I have. Yeah, I had um, some questions that um, I thought would be, I mean, interesting. I think you've answered it a little bit that Gigi was your, you know, internal, like what was going on, but is there any part of your main, of any part of Gigi that um, was based on yourself or was she kind of a separate um, entity uh, to you, just, you know, in you? <laughs> <laughs> she was like, she just said all the things that I would never say and she behaved in ways that I would never behave. Um, she or that I would want to, but I'm just too afraid of. She's like, but like an alter ego. Yeah. Okay. Um, but also, this it was um, this experience. You know, her living in London, like the transition that I made, also mm -hmm. to being in, in a different place in a different culture, uh, where things don't work the way that you expect them to. Um, I really enjoyed expressing that through her. Okay. Um, in my regular life uh people know me as like oh you know that's her kid that's the american mom um <laughs> but uh when you are uh, when you're an outsider to a place um people don't necessarily ask questions about where you're from they, and i think that to mothers in general we don't ask about their life before they had kids mm -hmm. um and so it was a nice way for me through her experience to talk about what it has been like me, um, living here. I've lived here a long time, 13 years, but, um, I'm still, I still don't belong. I mean, I'm always going to be, um, somewhat on the outside. Uh, so it was nice for me through her to actually express that. And some people close to me here have actually said that to me, that they've, it was a way to get to know me and what my experience has actually been. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that was a nice thing to be able to do through her. Mm -hmm awesome um so in the whole like there were lots of difficult parts and somebody who didn't experience postpartum depression i read it before jennifer read it I was like i will let you know like when it gets really hard in the chapter just so that you have a little bit of a heads up but like i remember it getting kind of hard um like really quick i is uh, like chapter three or four i was because i just had started reading it and i was like okay it's gonna get really quick actually so uh, but what what part did you find the most difficult to write about um and to get through to because 
you'd probably you probably have to relive a little bit of that in writing this. So what part um, was the most difficult for you? Um, so uh, so two parts really. Um, so the scene around 9/11, um, I did not uh, I didn't anyone personally in 9/11 in my family, but I was there on that day and I was um, I worked on. A, uh, at an organization that was based on Wall Street, which is very close to the towers. Mm -hmm. So on that day, I was present, um, and I, I, a friend of mine had just moved to the city. Uh, I grabbed her, led to the Staten Island Ferry Terminal. So um, that was all. That was hard to write because for many of us who were present on that day, I think it's still that that kind of experience is with you your whole life, mm -hmm. um, and it changes you forever, whether you lost someone personally or not. New York City lost so much. Mm -hmm. um, so that was emotional for me to write because I wanted to do a good job. I wanted to honor families who did lose someone. Um, I wanted to do it respectfully. And I was really worried about um, expressing emotions around that. Uh, I, I certainly would never want to misconstrue anyone's feelings um, who was so, you know, deeply personally affected. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I didn't want to take anyone's story so um, I purposely did not do too much research around it because I didn't want to invert, take someone else's story of their son or daughter or child who they lost. Um, so that was very emotional because I love New York. I've, I've always loved New York. And um, that certainly, though, was one of the most important experiences of my life. Um, and then the birth scene uh, is also quite, was tough to write. Um, it was very cathartic for me. It really me process the births of my kids um i wanted to write them though i've never personally seen uh a birth birth scenes written that way you rarely in fiction come across even c-sections um we all are very familiar with the image of you know birth and natural birth um and a woman pushing and screaming and yelling and then a baby comes out and uh, you know 20 minutes later like it's just like sure that happens um <laughs> You, I rarely, you rarely see the other experience. Um, and I think it's really important. I remember when I was, um, when I couldn't breastfeed my kids. Uh, so I pumped and when I, I would pump around the clock and I pumped um, when I was pumping in the middle of the night is when I would read. Uh, and I kept looking for books. Um, like where is this experience where is the c-section that was really horrible where's the woman who can't breastfeed where's the person who feels horrible inside their own body because things got really messed up where is that character and it's you rarely rarely see her mm -hmm. um it was really important to me i wanted to write that scene also in such a way so that if you have been through that trauma and if that is how you gave birth um you're not the only person that that happened to and it's really important for you to know that. Um, it, it also came from a place I can hear women who've had C-sections say that they feel guilt. They feel like they didn't do it right. Um, they feel like they, yeah, <laughs> I've, I've heard that a lot. Um, and that me, you know, I felt that way too. Uh, I really wanted things to go differently and they went left in a really bad way. Um, and uh, I just wanted to relieve us of that guilt i wanted to say that like you got your kid out and that is really the thing that matters yeah and the way that that the conversations you fall into sometimes with new mothers um the that some mothers feel in the way their births went which you know is wonderful and i wish good births for people absolutely mm -hmm. um but we seem to we kind of have an ownership over happens and if it happened in a good way well that that's down to us because we're amazing but if it happened in a bad way that's our fault because we just suck at birth <laughs> and we did everything wrong right. um, and really I came to realize for me the way that helped me to think about it is that none of us are in control of what's going to happen and you can prepare and you can take every class and you can read every book and you can visualize and you can hypnobirth and you can you can line everything up and and hopefully it way but it's really important for women and new mothers to know that if it doesn't go that way that's okay that's okay um and i feel like there's a real lack of that message um 
that if it if it all goes horribly wrong, um, that's okay. That's not your fault. Mm -hmm. um, it's not up to us how it happens. We can we make ourselves feel better by thinking that, but really, it's it's not up to us. Mm -hmm. um, so I really want that message for new mothers too. It's definitely a much needed message, I think. <laughs> you're absolutely right. I I know uh, Jennifer and I had been talking about um, a book club before we um, read your book and it's definitely hard to find books where it's you know having a baby isn't a paragraph and a chapter and then they go home and everything's great so <laughs> um, it, it's definitely it was much needed for sure um, and then my last the last question that I had was um, in your writing class I don't know um, I actually I went to school for creative writing um, so I I also took a, some classes for writing. I don't write, which is crazy, but, <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I write, you know, um, social media captions, but, <laughs> but um, I was often told in these classes to write what you know. Um, and what, so were you told that? And then based on that, what aspects of this besides, I guess, um, just the traumatic, of birth and um, what the postpartum depression and such. Um, what did you know? Like, I know you said that you lived in New York, so that that's an environment that you knew. I think you wrote um, characters from New Jersey. They were just, it was comical to read. Like, I loved it. It felt very real. So um, where, where did you get the inspiration for that? Um, and then I'm, have, did you have a baby in Europe, which I'm guessing you did, you've already answered that. But, um, so is that how you were familiar with the, um, the health system? Jennifer, uh, Jennifer talked about how interesting, sorry, I'm asking like 8,000 questions, <laughs> but um, we thought it was very interesting that, you know, after you've had a baby, you have a nurse come, you know, once, however many weeks or days and they check on you, but did they really check on you? <laughs> and um, we were just very interested in that. And um, I guess I'll stop there. So I do have one more question after that, but I'll let you answer the 5,000 I just <laughs> threw out at you first. <laughs> um, yeah, the experience, I um, want you to, best way to explain this. So in the UK, we have the National Health Service, Socialized Healthcare, which I know is always debated in the US because in the US we have the exact system, right? Um, but when you are raised in a particular system, you have an expectation of how things are going to be. So one of the more shocking and difficult things for me was entering this new health system where um, there is excellent care provided, but uh, things that we come to expect in the U.S., like having an obstetrician uh, who knows you and you see throughout your entire pregnancy on a regular basis, um, uh, people who are familiar with your case, that's, that doesn't happen in the NHS. So you um, are assigned midwives, you're assigned a team of midwives. Um, you rarely see the same person twice throughout your pregnancy. Um, you only see uh, an actual obstetrician or doctor if um, you're high risk or if they have other concerns about you. Um, it's midwife led here. Um, and in some ways, uh, you know, the midwives are excellent. They are absolute experts, incredible at what they do. Um, and there's something very empowering about that idea about women um, leading other women through birth and about it being led, to, you know, midwifery is, is an ancient practice right? So like this idea that it's done in the community and that it's led by women who have this knowledge, um, there's a lot about it that's really empowering and beautiful and midwives work really hard and they're incredible. Um, but I found it really difficult as an American who expected a doctor and someone who knew me to talk to me throughout the entire experience. I, I just felt very lost, but I tried to go with it. Um, there are other aspects of what they do here, which people all love, for example, having the community with wife come to your house. I know a lot of people feel here feel reported by that idea. And if you think about it, it's a beautiful idea that someone actually comes to see you in your home to check if you're okay. Um, but for me as an American, that was very alien. And I think also for probably for other immigrants from other places, it probably, I felt very invaded 
um, that someone at this vulnerable time in my life was coming into my home when I felt low and I was in such a bad state to have a stranger walk into my house and ask me personal questions, touch my baby. That was very, very hard for me. But I know that for lots of other women, they, they felt really supported and really helped by that. Um, so there are a lot of things about the health system to really recommend it. Um, but, but at the same time, um, you have such a massive socialized healthcare machine, um, you can get lost in the cracks. And I think that is a bit of what happened to me and a bit of why my births turned out the way that they did. Um, part of what I was writing about was this inner conflict that I have and really appreciating that we have a national health service because when my sons were ill, the care was absolutely extraordinary. And the fact that you can walk in here and you walk into any hospital, you don't have to worry about paying. No one's asking you about insurance. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, your background doesn't matter. You will get health care. Um, that is huge. Yeah. Uh, but there are drawbacks to that too. It's not a perfect system. Um, and women are not necessarily, um, when you're, when you're not, did like an individual when you're having a baby that's really hard or that was hard for me because of the way we're raised in the states mm -hmm. um so it is really interesting system and part of what i was writing about was trying to write about that inner conflict i have was appreciating how incredible it is and that the people who work within the system so like the midwife who's in the book you know, they're absolutely extraordinary um but sometimes a system that huge you can get lost so, mm -hmm. so for example when when Gigi also goes for counseling it's incredible that there is free counseling available here for mothers. Mm -hmm. Getting actual access to it is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to write about um, how it's great that we have this stuff, but it also doesn't necessarily work all the time. And in um, some cases, it seems like it's still just, you know, checking the box of yeah. getting yeah. it done. Too. I think any kind of public institution run that way, um, you do have the risk of that happening. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really the healthcare, you know, the, which, which way is better. I don't, I don't really know. Um, mm -hmm. but women seem to bear the brunt of it, uh, yeah. when we're in really risky situations. Right. Yeah. I think it's definitely apparent in, oh, I guess Archer wants to ask a question too. Um, <laughs> he, I think it's definitely apparent in the part where you know, she's, not getting out of bed and her husband's, you know, covering for her basically rather than be, she's, she's obviously having a problem and the midwife is right there. And it's like, like you're, you, and I was like, she's having problems. <laughs> like, how do you know that? And then like, like you said, like, it's checking a box. She was there that day. They did the checkup and then asked for tea before she left. And that was it. And it's just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so it was, it's definitely, I can see, I can see that. I think you did a wonderful job of portraying that. Yeah, there's definitely a culture. I don't think we ever think about healthcare as part of a culture, uh, but it is part of our culture. The way that we expect to be treated in healthcare environments is part of kind of our way of being. So when you're put into a different system that operates, it operates almost the exact opposite to the US. Um, there can be like a cultural component disconnect to it, um, which, you know, so I wanted to honor the people who work within the system, but also highlight, you know, it's tough, especially if you're not from here. And I'm, you know, I speak English as a first language. I can advocate for myself. If you're coming from anywhere else, um, trying to navigate this massive system, it can be really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I wanted to kind of uh, touch on too was just similarities, I guess, but before you had your children and before Gigi, well, Gigi had her, her adopted son, but um, just being a professional, like going from be, having a professional control over your life, you know, success in your life, and then going into a traumatic experience or traumatic birth, and then trying to figure it all out when it's all, you know, up against the wall. Um, is that, was that something that you kind of uh, drew from as well um, in your own experience? Uh, yeah. And I think it's, it's not just my experience, a lot of women who I've met, um, is, I, I, it's, you know, if you kind of took a survey of people around you, it's incredible. The brain power 
of a group of women who are mothers with new babies is extraordinary. The accountants, the doctors, the lawyers, the teachers, um, just the, the tech professionals, just the, just name it. Any group of mothers you look at has an incredible, just an incredible work resource. So many women struggle with getting back to work. Um, you might go back into your previous job, but I think we, it's a very common experience to feel that there are new expectations, to feel that there's new scrutiny, to be given flexibility if you ask for it and suffer the consequences of that because you're not getting promoted or you're not getting the projects that you know that you could have. Right. Um, or they're being harder on you because you have asked for flexibility. So now there's more of a microscope on you and what you're doing. Um, not allowing women to work from home or not giving flexibility or not trusting women. I think a big thing that happened to me was like, I just didn't feel like there was any trust that I would, that I would do a good job. There was suddenly like this expectation. Well, like she's bringing baggage with her, yeah. um, which is why I felt like I couldn't get hired. Yeah. Um, and I've met a lot of women, a lot of professional women who have felt the same thing. The juggle was too hard and they've stepped back either entirely or they've stepped, stepped back into roles that they're totally qualified for. Right. Um, and they have the ability to do much more, but they're not given access and they're not given the opportunity. Right. Um, so I wanted to kind of address that frustration that I have felt in groups of mothers. Um, and it's not all women, there are plenty of women who go back and who are super successful and take their career by storm. Um, but they, they do that with help. I think mm -hmm. we need to acknowledge that too. Right. Um, you can't do that unless there is someone, um, who is helping you, uh, with everything that needs to go on in the background when you have kids mm -hmm. and not everybody can afford that. Right. Um, so I, I wanted to address my frustration with that because it's definitely something I experienced. And um, I mean, I'm glad that I was able to find something that I can do now that lets me be around my kids. But um, yeah, I, I was I was not expecting I was not expecting that um, to happen. Mm -hmm. And when it did, I was um, I was really shocked that all the work I had put into getting that career suddenly didn't anything right because now you have a new title and so there's so much attached to that title yeah um yeah i definitely i agree with you from the traumatic c-section to the not breastfeeding to the <laughs> like, <laughs> like you're telling the whole the whole story <laughs> i also just want to give a shout out sorry i was looking for her name in the last couple of minutes but stefka she's our hero <laughs> um, shout out to stefka i love her so much i'm so glad you said that yeah um, i think stefka's story is really important too right for people to recognize uh you know Gigi's story on one hand yes like she's had a lack of opportunity she's really frustrated and she's messing up at work and she can't handle the juggle stefka sacrificed a huge amount to do what she is doing right. um, and she sacrificed everything she has sacrificed not being with her children in order to work to take care of them um, and I think that's really really important story to explore and to acknowledge mm -hmm. um, that there's like a two-tiered system that that professional women are like well I need help so that I can go be professional and have my career and who is helping us other women um, who, and what, what sacrifices are they making? What have they given up? What what are they dealing with? Um, it, it's also not a story that we often see. Mm -hmm. We often get a picture of the super mom and she's got an inept husband and there's a nanny, but <laughs> we never get the nanny story. Mm -hmm. Who has she left behind? Who is she supporting? What is she doing? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's really, really important to acknowledge. Awesome. Well, we are, I, we could, I can, can we talk for hours or? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy to. <laughs> um, but I guess I, um, gosh, it's just, it's just crazy because again, just thinking about all the conversations we have and, and the things we go, the go, we go through and read about. Um, but it's just so awesome to have, to have you here and to have, to have this your book as a platform for other moms who 
may be struggling or can't put the words to their struggle or struggled in the past. And they're like, oh my gosh, that was, you know, there's a part of me in there as well. Um, so just any kind of platform that we can have to raise voices for our moms and how you're kind of explaining how you're even healthcare in, in London, like we idealize here, like, oh my God, that'd be great. But there are, like you just mentioned, pros and significant pros and cons to that. So how's, you know, where's the, the balance for, for, for women and for mothers? Um, so that's something also to really, to really think about, but I guess in, in kind of closing, what would be some, or what is your advice to mothers now that you've kind of spoken to, <laughs> um, lots of people and, you know, kind of shared your experience as well. What, what do you like to leave, um, with, uh, I think the number one thing that I hope that any woman who is struggling with depression and motherhood, if she reads this book, what I want her to take away is that um, it will occur. It may not be right away. Um, the process of recovering is really important and please take your time doing it. Um, but it, it, it happens day by day and month by month. And then you reach a place where um, things are better than they were before and you feel better than you did, but it doesn't happen immediately. I think we get that picture in our heads that you have the baby and then everything like, you know, all systems go um, and, and going back to work and taking care of the baby and dealing with the family. Um, if that's not happening for you, then that's okay. Um, it will, it will eventually. And if it takes time, that's okay. It should take time because you've had a massive thing happen to you. <laughs> Having a baby is a massively big deal. <laughs> um, so just to take your time, just to take your time, I think is really, really important. And I wish someone had said that to me. Well, thank you so much. It was so wonderful talking to you. <laughs> I had a great time. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And so the book, again, I'm just going to do a little shameless promotion. <laughs> but when I ran away, um, Kate, thank you for being a part of this and being a mom as you do it. <laughs> yes, it's making a lot of noise. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. And if there's any questions or anything, um, you know, we'll, we'll get them to you. But I uh, just so appreciate your time and your talent and your a passion for for women and mothers to share your own story through your novel so thank you, thank you so much thank you so much you guys are doing great work i'm really really happy to know that there's organizations like this it's great thank you <laughs> we'll talk to you soon for sure okay. all right bye thanks bye.